Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Tiny Home Heroes. Today I'm having a chat with Kelsey of Kelsey's Caravans out of Cochrane, Alberta, just on the edge of the majestic Canadian Rockies. Kelsey has many years of personal experience kayaking, whitewater rafting, backcountry camping, hiking, mountain biking, rock climbing, and even ice climbing. Today, she has turned that passion for the outdoors into a thriving small business that is focused on the unique experience of each and every individual looking for a more exciting or tailored outdoor adventure. Through activities like rafting, stand-up paddleboarding, and hiking, Kelsey aims to share with everyone her love and knowledge of the great outdoors. And now, Kelsey's Caravans offers tiny home hostels, so you can stay on adventures even longer. It's just one more way tiny homes are having an impact in Canada. Are you ready? Let's get to it. Great to have you with me today. So today, everybody, I have with us uh, Kelsey Baldwin um, from Kelsey's Caravans, um, and they are an outfit out near Cochrane, Alberta, um, and she offers such a wide variety of, of, of products and, and uh, fun things to do and even some fun places to stay for a little while. So uh, welcome, Kelsey, to, to the show. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm really pumped to be here. Um, this is kind of my first tiny home interview episode i guess you could say so i'm really excited to kind of talk about why why tiny and why this outfit so yeah thanks for having me i'm pumped well that's actually really a good way to, to kind of just kind of bang into this and and ask you you know what is your why you didn't get into uh tiny homes until recently from what i understand it wasn't you know your business model in the beginning um so tell us your why how did your business model go from um, a very successful outdoor adventure company to to adding a tiny home hostel idea to that. I guess the whole hostel concept was kind of my end goal from the start. Um, I wasn't sure what that was going to look like, but I did know that I wanted to offer affordable places for adventurers to stay. Because I know for myself, uh, when I'm traveling, I want to sleep as cheaply as possible and spend my cash on doing fun stuff. So there isn't really anything like that here in the Bow Valley, unfortunately. You know, you can't really spend a night anywhere for under $100 a night. So I wanted to really change that because there's a lot of people like me out there who, you know, maybe they're single or with a partner and they want to travel affordably, but it's just not really feasible in this neck of the woods. So starting to do um, the tiny home hostel idea, for one, I, I like the idea of tiny, like living tiny on wheels. I like the portability, like the portableness of it. And I like the sustainable aspect, kind of living more minimally than people think we should be living. Um, taking things down just a little bit from, you know, four bedroom houses to a really functional tiny space is kind of where I see the world going and trending towards in general. And I wanted to really bring that aspect into, you know, the adventure field and the guiding field and accommodation style. So. Yeah, that's kind of kind of where things started and where I want to end up going, I guess you could say. All right, so let's back up a little bit then and let's talk about your just really quickly about your your business. Um how did it get started and and what sort of things if you can tell us what sort of things you offer in less than a half an hour, let us know, tell us what you do. Yeah, totally. So I offer uh privately guided rafting, hiking and stand up paddleboard trips in the Bow Valley. I have a bunch of areas in Kananaskis country and on the Bow River that I offer these trips through. So they're all very family friendly, uh beginner friendly. The whole premise behind my guiding business is to get people outside who've never been outside before really. Like never held a paddle, never put on a hiking boot, never set up a tent kind of thing. There's a lot of I don't want to use the word gatekeeping, but there is a little bit of gatekeeping in the outdoor industry. And I really want people to feel comfortable being able to go outside. But I find there's so many people who just don't know where to start, how to start, who to ask, where to get the gear. So I wanted to start this business to encourage folks to get outside. And maybe I can teach them a couple of things about, you know, different resources and different ways to do stuff that just makes them feel comfortable to do it on their own. So that was kind of the whole idea behind starting the guiding aspect. And then on top of that, um, like I mentioned before, there's nowhere really affordable to stay in the Bow Valley. So I wanted to pair it together. Um, people could book an adventure with me, but then also sleep affordably at a place that I could uh, provide. So I wanted to kind of roll it all into one package for, for folks to, to be able to book and just keep it simple. And I mean, eventually, if you book a, book a stay with me, Kelsey's Caravan Adventure Hostel, and maybe you want to go horseback riding or do an ATV tour or something that I can't offer. Being able to offer a shuttle service for those collaborative 
you know, adventures in the future is something that I want to look into as well. So I have a lot of visions about collaboration in the future and ways to incorporate other businesses as well as, you know, amplifying the things that I do and letting people stay somewhere that's relatively affordable. I could definitely see you building a lot of bridges um, as you go along and see uh, different ways just an adventure group can really, you know, it's kind of a general thing, adventure group. I mean, you could tack on all kinds of things to that. Um, and that's really, really neat. And and you don't come at that from just somebody who wanted to start a business. You're an adventurous sort yourself, and you have quite a lot of qualifications that give you, um, you know, that would give people a lot of confidence in your abilities and give people a reason to come to you for these sorts of services, wouldn't they? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I would hope so. I spent, uh, I did spend a lot of time and a lot of training the last couple of years. Like, I mean, just like any other field that people work in, you're always trying to look for the new and most updated way to perform and way to do your job. So I'm constantly looking at new courses, new ways to do things, you know, upping my certification. So yeah, I have, you know, a class four river rafting certification through the province of Alberta. And I have my class one certification through Paddle Canada. And, you know, I'm a swift water rescue technician through Raven Rescue. All of these certifications, you know, take money, they take time, they take a lot of study and a lot of, you know, physical practice. So I, I hope that it comes across to people that book an adventure with me that, you know, they're in good hands and that we're there to have fun. You know, I don't want them to worry about the safety aspect because I have that covered. I want them to really just have a good time and, you know, enjoy the beautiful Rocky Mountains that we live in. That's that's the whole goal. Yeah, well, for sure. And going over your website, it's it's painfully obvious that that you're qualified and that and that people uh, who have who have gone with your services trust you and you've got some, you know, some really nice things said about you. And. And, you know, the information on your website, that's kind of no BS, you know, it kind of says what, what you say, you give us some ideas of your philosophy, you tell us what you do. Um, so everybody out there, go to her website. She has a, a Facebook account, an Instagram account, and, and a really awesome website. Um, we'll, of course, put all the links for that down there. And now I want to kind of get into the tiny home thing. Sure. And so let's talk about your tiny home hostel. And um, I understand that you used... Uh, tiny um, Fritz tiny homes or f- for your build yeah. and that's Heather Fritz over there who by the way everybody um, was a member as an alumni member of the board of tiny home alliance of Canada yeah her and Kevin with Fritz tiny homes have been phenomenal to work with you know I started drafting kind of my building design with them last December so December 2020 2021 time means nothing anymore I'm having trouble with dates um, but last, uh, yeah, last December. So over the course of three or four months, we had a couple zoom calls and really like locked in the design of how I wanted the tiny home laid out according to, you know, what I do professionally, but also like, I'm an avid whitewater kayaker. I do a lot of rock climbing, I ice climb all of these things I really wanted to have space for. So they were really intuitive in how, you know, it makes sense for a tiny home because I've never worked with tiny homes before. So they really helped me kind of walk through the process of what makes sense for what I want, but also what just makes sense for storage and for building design where things will actually fit as opposed to maybe I wanted them to fit. Um, yeah, they were a phenomenal resource and really, really welcoming, friendly people the whole the whole way through. So I think from be- from starting in December through to that following September, It was design, building layout, getting materials, the build process, and then it was delivered to my door, you know, just over a half a year later. So it was a really long, but also very fast process in a sense. That doesn't sound too bad to me. And, you know, having worked with, with, uh, with her, it's, she's a very organized, a very straightforward person. She's the kind of person you kind of want on your side. You, you can trust what's, what she says. If she says you can't do that, there's no argument because you're like, okay. That's yeah. cool. That's and then she's also the kind of person that will come up with a solution as well. She's not one of those infuriating people that always see a problem with everything, um, yeah. but can't seem to come up with any solutions. You know, she's she's a very solution oriented person. So you're really lucky to be working with her. So let's get into. Do you, do you live in a tiny home? I do. Yeah, I'm in my tiny home full time now. So talk about your tiny home. Like, how did you um, come to use uh, Fritz? tiny homes, but more importantly, how did you come to the decisions about the design of your home and what you required? Yeah. So I found Fritz, like anybody finds anything on Google. Um, I had tried contacting probably seven or eight different tiny home building companies between Manitoba and BC. 
Wow. Um, and I just was getting quotes, looking at different blueprint layouts, trying to contact companies. Um, at that time, everybody was really busy and they didn't have space for me. Or if they did, it wouldn't be for a few years. Or they also didn't have flexibility on, you know, working with me to create a home. It was more like you have to pick a blueprint that they offer and then they could build that for me. But there was no flexibility on customizing, you know, where would the bed go? How did I want the loft to be? you know, spaced out where I want my shelves to go. There was no really room for wiggle there. Um, whereas Fritz, when I emailed them, cause they were like my ninth company that I tried to get a quote from, um, when they emailed me back saying, yep, yeah, we'll just do a shell build for you. Uh, I was kind of ecstatic because nobody said that that was okay. It had it to be like so a- easy though. Easier actually. <laughs> yeah. And that's what they said. I'm surprised that nobody else was able to do this with me, but everyone else just seemed to have like their layouts and that was what, you know, was up to code. So that's, they, they wouldn't, you know, work with me, I guess, to change things that were already up to code on their end. So going with Fritz, they're like, yeah, um, we understand you don't want us to do the interior for you. We don't, you don't want us to do fully customizable countertops and appliances and stuff. Um, so we're happy to just do the shell build for you. And I'm like, that's amazing because for one, that's more affordable for me. I was, oh, it was way easier for me to finance a build like that than to do completely 100% custom. Um, so that worked worked in my favor for that reason. And just being able to keep it simple and they provide a product that's just the exterior and then having my friends come in, my contractor friends come in and kind of share the wealth a little bit. I hire some friends out to do, you know, the drywalling and putting up the counters and installing my shower and stuff like that. It was kind of good to to spread, spread the wealth a little bit in that way and spread the work. So did you find you were able to use better materials or you were able to do things that you might not have been able to do because you saved so much money building tiny? I mean, does that, is that part of the process, part of the equation, I guess? Yeah, honestly, there's a lot of appliances that I found off of Facebook marketplace in Kijiji. Uh, I really want to try to be as you know, upcycling as possible in regards to equipment and gear and appliances too. So my kitchen counter sink and my tap are all upcycled. Um, The only things that I brought, bought brand new was my washer dryer combo and my fridge, but otherwise like my, my shower head, my sink and my bathroom, um, you know, a couple other items are all like upcycled from finds that I found on Facebook and other people. So yeah. It looks like you went kind of minimalistic over there. Just like, you know, you're, 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 I can see that what you're saying is true. You know, you really do believe in, I, I just need this one thing, you know, an open shelf is just yeah. as good as a shelf with a cupboard around it any day of the week. Yeah. And for me, like, I really like, there's a lot of stuff that isn't done quite yet in my tiny home. It's, it's okay. still a work in progress on the inside, um, which was another reason why I didn't want to go fully customizable because I knew there was things in the tiny home that I wanted to kind of pick away at myself um, over the months and just kind of work on, cause I, I do have a little bit of an artistic side. So I wanted to kind of play around with painting and textures and stick on wallpapers and stuff. So, um, yeah, some of the shelving isn't done. Um, a little bit of the loft work is, not I think it looks great. Just like it is. It's a little bit rustic and a little bit modern because of the modern appliances a little more. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's going to show us around everybody and we're going to show us around too much. Cause you're going to ruin the cribs. Oh you know, yeah. I'll just give you like a quick, you know, and so whereabouts are you located? Are you on someone's land or are you on your own land? Hi, puppy. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's my girl, Gypsy. Um, oh, how do I flip this back? There we go. Oh, so the people listening um, to the podcast are going to be a podcast are going to be really confused about this part. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry, if, if you want to if you want to see the video, everybody head over to head over to Patreon and you're going to watch the video. There you go. So. It's like to keep you on your toes, right? Sure. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm currently parked on a really good friend of mine's acreage. So she owns a ranch out here um, close to Bragg Creek. So she's letting me park kind of on her property while I finish the interior myself. So how lucky is that? Yeah, she's been a friend of mine for years now. And finding property is one of the biggest hurdles to park a tiny home for sure. So I'm really lucky to have, you know, this this option to park here while I keep finishing the the inside of the home. And you say, well, you keep finishing the home. So obviously that's not a permanent location. So What's yeah. your process right now? Obviously, you're probably in the middle of trying to sort of searching out where am I going to put this when I'm done? So what sort of challenges are you facing? Um, challenges basically include finding property that I can afford. <laughs> right now in the Bow Valley, there's acreages 
that come up for sale, but then they're gone within a couple of days. Standard three bedroom houses are selling sight unseen kind of thing. So acreages out here are also kind of selling the same way. As soon as they pop up, they're gone. Or it's 1.5 million for, you know, 10 to 20 acres, depending how close you are to Calgary or not. There, it doesn't seem to have any rhyme or reason as to why they charge what they charge for, for acreages, but proximity is for the number. It's because they can. Just because they can. Exactly. So that's my biggest problem right now. Exactly. It's the kind of world real estate is in right now. It's not a it's not a world where people, oh, is it worth that much money? It's not even a question you're allowed to ask anymore. You're not allowed to ask how much is it worth or what is, you know, what's what cost is it? It's not even, those aren't questions you're allowed to ask. All you're allowed to ask is what did the last guy pay for? It? And you know, you're going to have to pay 10 or 25% more than that. Yeah. You know, and, that, and that's it. It has nothing to do with the worth of the property, where it is, what it's on, what materials it's built out of anymore. It's just about what did the last guy pay? You're going to pay way more. And that's the end of it. Yeah. And it's, and it's unfortunate because all I'm looking for is raw land, no utility hookups, no nothing put into the property. Um, all of my tiny homes for the hostel will eventually be entirely off grid. So I do want to have like a solar setup. I have a composting toilet in my tiny home as well. So I want all of my tiny homes to have compost composting toilets on them. Um, water is going to be trucked in. I don't need water lines hooked up. So everything that I require will be able to be portable and movable and just put on site. I don't need utilities dug into the land, but It'd be off grid hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. That's the goal. So finding raw land is definitely the biggest challenge I face at the moment. Crazy because there's just so much land out there. Mm -hmm. If you look at a map of crown land, you go look at it like a tech, like a, a color map of the crown land in the, in Canada. And it's just re ridiculous how much land there is and why are they holding it? What's, yeah. you know, what's going on there. And we can put ecologically sound buildings on there that help with a lot of different social challenges and still people like you, who are obviously knowledgeable, educated, you, even you're having challenges trying to just sort of, where can I put this thing? So what about your tiny home hostel for your adventure group now? How is that a different challenge altogether? Um, if I, out here, depending on which county I would set up my business in, currently I'm looking at staying in Rocky View County and I have gone to the Rocky View County office a handful of times to talk in person about what does that look like for putting a tiny house on wheels on a piece of property. So for my business, because I would have more than three dwellings, I'm given two dwellings that I can have just as is, but then every dwelling after that would have to be a permit application. Um, so there isn't a no, but it is just a kind of drawn out process. And this is a very recent thing. Rocky View County was very kind of red tape around tiny homes. They didn't want you living in a tiny home. You couldn't even sleep in your RV camper on your property if you wanted to do that. You had to like only sleep in it if you were currently building a home with a foundation. Otherwise you couldn't sleep in a anything that was on wheels basically was was a no-go. So now the conversation in Alberta, I know for sure, is almost a non-starter. Yeah. Um, we have one board member, uh Barbara Rowe. Uh she's if you if you look at our at her blogs, uh, she's writing about her experience buying and building and living in a tiny home. Mm -hmm. um, so she lives in a tiny home down in Al in Lethbridge, and oh, okay. she's almost homeless in a sense because of the way that she's being forced to be transient. Yeah, you know, living in a campground and moving here after the ninety days, and then moving back there again, and just sort of, you know, lucky that her home's on a trailer, but she's got a wide one, so she needs a three ton to tow to tow it. So she needs a wide load permit, right, for tiny home, you know. So the complications just pile up one after the other. Yeah. But, and, and it's sad in a way that I've noticed that different provinces are at different levels of this whole adoption of, of tiny homes or smaller dwellings, in a sense, um, to combat the, the whole um, housing crisis and whatnot. So with your tiny home hostel, is it built already? Do you have one in operation? No, it's not built yet. The goal behind this tiny home was once I was finished the interior myself, I would start kind of beta testing this home first having people come and stay in this home. I do have like a adventure van um, that I use for all my trips. So it's got a bed and a cook stove and stuff in it. So yeah, so while people stayed in this home, um, they could try out the tiny home living, try out the hostel vibe and the hostel atmosphere. And then I would stay in the van. And then if they wanted to book a trip with me, we could do that too. But that's, that's going to be a little ways down the road until I can find property to actually park this on and start kind of hosteling out this tiny home. 
So yeah, I would start with this home first, see how that goes for the, you know, the first year or two, and then slowly add to my tiny home fleet after that. I don't really want to have more than four or five tiny homes total. I don't want to have like 50 tiny homes hostled out. You'd on have to increase property. your staff to manage all of that. That, and I just think it takes away the entire adventure, custom, private vibe. I don't, I don't want to pack people in, you know, I don't want someone to feel like they're one of a hundred sheep kind of thing. I want everybody to be able to enjoy their solitude, enjoy the mountains, how they're meant to be enjoyed and just have a special time in a special place. So one of the reasons I wanted a tiny home on wheels specifically, um, so that I could move around eventually. I do a lot of climbing and paddling in the States. Uh, especially, and I have family back in Manitoba. So having the option to move the home wherever I want to for a couple of months out of the year is really freeing for me. Um, so that was a really big incentive to one, have it on wheels and to build it in a way that it doesn't need a road permit. Um, so it is like 26 feet long by 8.6 feet wide. So all I really need to do to move it is I could use, you know, like a, a dually truck, but for, for now, I've been renting a truck hauling company so that liability wise, if anything happens to the home during transport, their insurance would cover damages. So but it's not a wide load. So you don't have to worry about extra insurance or anything like that. Yeah. And it's not super tall. It's like 12 and a half feet tall, 12 feet tall. So it fits like all within all the road regulations, which makes it really simple for me. Now, BC has got a great thing going on for tiny home communities. I'm really, I'm always watching Facebook pages over there, you know, different plots of land or you know, tiny home pads coming up for rent or homes being sold. Like it's a whole different culture out there. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. It really is. Yeah. And we, we really hope that kind of, we need that to rub off everywhere else, everywhere yeah. else in a sense. So what challenges um, it's, I, I, you know, I kind of, I ask everybody this and, and, but I think it's important to hear from as many people as possible. And what, how did you get around the codes, you know, building code and everything? Is that something you relied on your builder for, or is it something that you had to deal with yourself? It was all initiated through Kevin and Heather Fritz. Um, they have a person, Rob Feeney, I believe is his name, out of BC that they work with to make sure that my house is up to code. So everything that they build on their end is up to fire code within restrictions that they need to build to. And then if I want my house to be able to transport easily to and from the States, it needs to, again, be up to a certain standard of code on top of that. So um Throughout this next couple of months, while I finish installing shelves and finish installing, you know, I have barn sliding barn doors that I want to put up there. Once all the kind of nicky nacky stuff is finished, I send all that information into him. And then he plugs it in basically into a blueprint um, saying whether it is up to his standards or not for me to have that NFPA certification, I believe is what it's called, or one of the code numbers underneath the NFPA. So yeah, that's been really great because this guy has been, his name's Rob. I believe it's Rob. Um, he's been really easy to chat with, um, really simple to communicate with through a couple of different online platforms. So yeah, you that's a thing that you can opt into. You don't have to. It's like a $1,500 code ticket to get certified in. So I didn't have to go that route if I didn't want to, but because of me wanting to travel as much as I do with this home in the future, I just wanted to make sure all my codes were in place just future proof it as much as I can. So I don't have to worry about it later because with the tiny house community and movement in Canada changing so much and in North America changing so much, there isn't really a set standard. Like there isn't like a bar to hit to make sure that, you know, this is a certified tiny home. There's a couple different ways that you can meet certain codes, but there isn't a standard across the board. Well, I know it's probably a bit, it's a big, uh, it's a big deal breaker for a lot of people who are even just researching, you know, viability. Can I afford this? Where can I get it? You know, when they answer all the questions, a lot of people answer a lot of the questions about where can I put it and all this stuff. And then they get to the point where, how do I get it approved? And since there's no book you can go read to tell yeah. you that, Everything you hear, all the advice you hear, anybody you ask, anybody you call, it's all kind of conjecture. You can never be 100% sure that what you're going to do is going to work. You can't ever be 100% sure that when you build your house that the government's going to let you live in it. Yeah. Um, Kelsey, I really want to thank you for, for joining us today uh, for with, uh, with um, Tiny Home Heroes. This is what we're calling the show now. Um, yeah, and, and I really hope that uh, we can kind of get back in touch with you later on when you've got your tiny home hostel up and running. 
um, maybe we can have an interview with the first uh, with the first tenant or the first person that stays in there and you know, talk, kind of talk about what that was like. Whatnot. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, I really appreciate you having me here. This was really great. I love talking about tiny and the tiny lifestyle. A lot of my friends and family don't get it. So <laughs> the more that I can talk about it and kind of share, like, it's not that intimidating, but you just got to know what you're doing. Um, the more I can talk about it, the, you know, I, I think the better it is for everybody as a whole. So thanks for having me. No problem. Absolutely. And learning is so fun. So um, thanks for being here. And thanks, everybody, uh, for, for joining us for this talk with uh, Kelsey's Caravan, Kelsey Baldwin of Kelsey's Caravans. Um, again, all the links to her Facebook, Instagram, and, and her website will be uh, below here. Um, thanks very much, everybody. And we'll talk to you very soon. Thank you.